Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, hope you all have had a good weekend. And it's a beautiful day today. Happy Mother's Day uh, to all of you. Um, as we uh, begin, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. I know we have uh, a few folks I want to have on the prayer list this morning um, who, are, who are out for different reasons. Um, I'd like us to keep Nathaniel and, and Daisy in prayer. They're out uh, traveling this weekend. They're on a camping trip to celebrate Nathaniel's birthday. Uh, so they won't be with us today, and um, they went out more towards eastern Kentucky, and we, I think they'll be coming back today, and we want to pray for their safe travels. Um, also, Tammy Ratliff messaged Kelsey this morning, and uh, Ratliff will not be here because Robert is feeling uh, under the weather this morning, so we want to pray for him, and that he feels better soon and is able to be back with us. Um, also, I believe... Um, Ruth Reynolds is not feeling super well this morning either, so I don't think they'll be worshiping with us, and we want to keep them in prayer. Um, are there others who we want to be praying for this morning? Uh, one I, I also want to add to the prayer list. I've been mentioning a professor of mine at Asbury, Dr. Joseph Donjel, and his wife who had heart transplant surgery. Um, Things were looking positive for a while, but they got uh, a negative report uh, earlier, well, well, this past week. Uh, her heart, her body has accepted the heart, but she still has hypertension, which is the whole reason that they did the heart transplant in the first place. And her, currently, her new heart is working about as well as her old heart was. So in some sense, it's like they're back to square one. Uh, and of course, she also has all the additional complications that went along with the surgery. So that was really discouraging news. And uh, it's, there's not, um, it's not no hope for things to get better, but the outlook is, is not positive right now. So I'd like us to keep the Dongel family in prayer as well. D-O-N-G-E-L-L. -L. Anyone else who we want to be praying for this morning? Well, uh, if you would, go with me in prayer, and um, if you will go with me in prayer, and then we'll get Bible class uh, started. So bow with me, please. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a new day. Thank you for waking us up and giving us a new week uh, ahead where we can serve and honor you and experience your goodness and love. Uh, we ask that you'll walk with us through this week and whatever's to come, uh, good things or difficult things. Uh, please bless us and be with us. Father, we pray for those on our prayer list this morning, those in the bulletin, uh, those who maybe went unmentioned this morning, uh, but also <clears throat> we, we lift up these people in particular. Father, we want to pray for some among us who are uh, not with us this morning. We pray for Daisy and Nathaniel as they travel back uh, from their camping trip. We pray that that was a great time for them to spend together, and we ask that you'll keep them safe as they travel home. Uh, we pray for... Um, our brother and elder, Robert Ratliff, who's not feeling too well this morning, who was under the weather. Uh, bless him. We pray that he'll feel better soon. Be with Ruth and Jim Reynolds as well. Uh, watch over them and bless them uh, if they're not feeling too terribly well this morning either. Father, we also want to lift up um, a friend of mine, a teacher at Asbury, Dr. Joseph Donjel, and his wife with the discouraging news that they received this past week. Father, we continue to lift them up. We know that you can do all things, and we pray for her. We pray for uh, her heart. We pray for the, the, uh, her continual development after this surgery. Uh, as she continues to do physical therapy and other things, we ask that you would bless her. Um, we know that that news they received was, was discouraging, but we continue to lift them up in prayer. Father, we know of other things, other situations around the world that need you. We especially pray for the ongoing war in Ukraine. And we pray that there can be peace there. Bless those who have already been terribly affected by that conflict. Father, as we look into uh, the Gospel of Luke this morning, and as we consider um, what Luke, under the inspiration of your Spirit, has revealed to us about Jesus and um, what he came to earth for and what that means for us today, uh, help us to be attentive. And we pray that this, is, uh, this time is a blessing to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, again, good morning. Uh, we're, we're back in the Gospel of Luke this morning. We actually were in the Gospel of Luke last week as well, but not as part of our series on the Gospel of Luke. You may remember we had 
guest speaker, Ty Kalish, out here last week. Uh, he spoke to us on the parable of the prodigal son, so we never really left the Gospel of Luke. Um, but we took a break from our study of the Gospel of Luke in, in the fashion that we've been doing it last week. So I want to do a little bit of review because I, what, we've, what we talked about two weeks ago I'm sure is quite fuzzy uh, for all of us. Uh, so we'll do a little review and then move forward this week. But um, a couple of weeks ago we read the actual birth of Jesus uh, in Luke chapter 2. And we also read after, after reading that and, and the events surrounding it with the angels appearing to the shepherds and, and all these things. Uh, we read about a trip that Jesus uh, took to the temple. Actually, his parents took him there as, as a child, only eight days old, uh, to be circumcised. And um, this early, so far in Luke, we're, we're still only in the second chapter, but we've already seen clear signs um, already that Jesus will be a very different kind of Savior than the, the kinds of Saviors uh, people are used to looking for uh, in the world. And he will reverse a lot of the values, a lot of the standards of, of his world. And uh, we've also been given some hints already about what will happen um, because of Jesus. We'll, we've been given some hints that some Jews will reject Jesus, some will accept Jesus. Uh, the Gentiles are going to glorify God because of Jesus. Um, and we mainly got these hints through two prophets who spoke to Jesus and to his parents while he was there in the temple. Uh, Simeon, the prophet Simeon, and then also the prophetess Anna, who we didn't get to last week. We'll look at her um, this morning. But we cover most of that episode of Jesus in the temple at only eight days old two weeks ago. Um, and that, that episode that, again, we'll, we'll finish this morning, but... That moment of Jesus in the temple as an infant, that's um, actually one of two back-to-back -back episodes of Jesus in the temple uh, early in the Gospel of Luke. So again, in the first one, Jesus is only a few days old. In the second one that we'll get to this morning, uh, Jesus is 12 years old. And the second episode of Jesus in the temple, that, that episode will close out the opening section of Luke that we've been in for the past a uh, few weeks, and, and that opening section is dedicated to the birth and the, and the childhood of Jesus and John the Baptist. So we'll finish that out, and then after that, Luke will fast forward to the adult ministries of John the Baptist and, uh, and Jesus. And so I'm hoping, if, if time allows, since we have a little catch-up work to do from two weeks ago, but if time allows, I'm hoping what we'll do is uh, close out this section and then we'll see how John begins to prepare the way for Jesus, which is exactly what uh, he was born to do, exactly what he was prof it was prophesied he would do. Uh, and we'll also see some things that happened to Jesus that prepared him for ministry. So John will be preparing the people for ministry. Some things will happen to Jesus that prepare him uh, for ministry. So as we move past the opening chapters of Luke and move into the next section, the theme of preparation is going to become prominent. Um, preparation for Jesus's ministry and, and preparation for God's salvation, God's uh, redemption through Jesus and how that will become visible to the world. So we're moving past the time of birth and, and into a time of, of preparation now in Luke. Uh, but first again, let's wrap up um, the first moment of Jesus in the temple as an infant that we didn't quite wrap up last time. Um, after Jesus and Mary encounter Simeon, uh, they have another unexpected encounter in the temple, and, and this time, again, it's with the prophetess Anna. So just to summarize, before we read about Anna, Simeon, because what Simeon says is really important, just to, to refresh our minds, uh, when Simeon sees Jesus in the temple, uh, he says that seeing Jesus means he has seen God's salvation for Israel, and, and also God's salvation for all the nations, not just Israel. Um, but he also says that because of Jesus, many in Israel will rise and many in Israel will fall. Uh, he also says a sword will pierce Mary's soul as well uh, as these things unfold. So there's some, some notes of promise and expectations in Simeon's words, but also some darker, ominous, um, and certainly for Mary and Joseph, more mysterious things that Simeon says also. Um, but something that we'll see here as we move past Simeon and move on to Anna, uh, something that we'll see here that we'll keep on seeing as we continue in this study of Luke is that Luke frequently has similar events side by side with one another, um, or, or at least close together, 
with one event involving a, involving a man and one event involving a woman, and they'll be similar. Uh, so we'll see this when we get into Jesus' miracles. In the Gospel of Luke, we'll, we'll see how Jesus will heal a man of something, and then maybe a couple of episodes later, he'll, he will heal a woman of something very similar, or he'll perform a similar miracle that will affect a man in one instance, a woman in another. And this is the first instance of this kind of thing. We read the prophet Simeon, and right after it, we get the prophetess um, Anna. So, uh, let's see, here's the microphone. Uh, would someone like to read verses 36 through 38? I would say just go ahead and read. Okay, so Anna is quite an impressive individual. Uh, she is someone who, after her husband died, she has devoted her life uh, worshiping in the temple. Um, and she is an elderly woman uh, by this point. And while Jesus is there as an eight-year-old, I mean, an eight-day-old infant in the temple with, with his parents, uh, she comes up and she gives thanks to God. And she's telling others nearby about the redemption of Jerusalem. So like Simeon, who we looked at two weeks ago, um, she is someone who is looking forward to this time of renewal and restoration, uh, salvation for God's people. And like Simeon, she recognizes that Jesus has um, a big part to play in that. So as we draw this section of Luke to a close, uh, I'd like us to make a couple of observations. A lot of these observations um, deal with what we looked at a couple weeks ago. And again, I know some of that is fuzzy, but um, a couple of, of observations. Um, a theme running through uh, this entire temple scene is that Jesus is surrounded by devout, godly Jews uh, right after his birth. So his devout parents, Mary and Joseph, they bring him to Jerusalem because they're doing what God's law uh, requires. And devout, godly Simeon comes and blesses God and gives an obscure prophecy as he does that. And then devout Anna comes up uh, to him and speaks about the redemption of Jerusalem. So I think that Luke is trying to emphasize to us in this scene of Jesus in the temple that Jesus is for devout, conscientious, godly Jewish people. And this is really important for Luke to emphasize early in his gospel because by the time that Luke will actually write the gospel of Luke, um, he and the early Christians, they have seen a lot of Jews reject Jesus. Uh, and Jews by the time, sorry, this has been coming in now. But again, Luke has seen a lot of Jews reject Jesus, um, and, and Jews generally consider the few of them who have accepted Jesus. The others would look at those Jews as mistaken, terribly mistaken, um, maybe ungodly, unfaithful uh, to, to the Lord, perhaps even untrustworthy. And so it's really important that at the beginning of Luke's gospel, he is showing how from the earliest days, as soon as Jesus uh, was born, Jesus has been the fulfillment of everything the Jews have been looking for. Uh, so being a good Jew, Luke wants his readers to know, being a good Jew does not mean rejecting Jesus. Uh, it means embracing him. Uh, and that's because embracing Jesus means embracing everything that God um, has promised and that he's always had in store uh, for his chosen people. And not just for his chosen people, but also... Um, for all the uh, for all the nations. <clears throat> all right.
right, so before we move on to the second scene in the temple, um, Luke gives us also a little snapshot of Jesus' childhood. Um, Barbara, would you care to also read for us verses 39 and 40? So after doing everything that the law um, required surrounding the birth of, of a child, um, Jesus' parents then take Jesus and they return from the temple and they come to the hometown of Nazareth. And Luke gives us a little brief description right here of Jesus' early years. Uh, he grows up. He becomes strong. Uh, he's already filled with wisdom. Uh, and, and that wisdom is really going to be on display here in the, in the second scene that we'll read of young Jesus uh, as a boy uh, in the temple. And so with that in mind, um, let's go ahead and begin looking at um, Jesus' second trip to the temple. Um, Before we actually start reading it, I want us to notice the verse that is at the end of this next passage that we're going to look at. Um, At the end of this second moment of Jesus in the temple, we again read that as Jesus grows, he grows in wisdom and he grows in favor with God and man. So these verses, um, Jesus' second trip to the temple has on either side of it, kind of like bookends, on either side of this um, account that we're about to read, references to Jesus' wisdom and Jesus' favor with God. And so on either side, we have these clues um, of the main ideas that are going to be presented in this second episode of Jesus in the temple. Um, What we're about to read is a demonstration of Jesus' wisdom and God's favor uh, upon him. So uh, let's go ahead and and read this. Uh, Would anyone be willing to first read for us verses 41 through 45? Uh, Ernie. Okay, so we've already seen um, from the last episode of Jesus in the temple that Jesus' parents are devout and godly Jews, and here at the outset we get another indication of that. Um, Every year they go up to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. So this isn't actually Jesus' second trip to the temple. It's the second trip that Luke gives us, but every year um, they, they go up, and that's something that Jews were expected to do. Um, that comes from a commandment in Deuteronomy. Um, Barbara, go ahead. Mm, good question. Um, that account of Jesus going to Egypt is only mentioned in Matthew. It's not here in Luke. Um, it's a good question about whether they would have gone from Egypt while they were there. Um, it's not that Luke doesn't want us... Luke is not saying that didn't happen. He's just choosing not to include it. That's information that only Matthew includes for us. Um, I think at the end of the day, we don't really know if they would have gone while Jesus was in Egypt. Um, It was much harder for Jews living outside of the surrounding area to make that trip. And most Jews living outside outside of the promised land um, were not able to make that trip every single year. Um, Perhaps they made the trip every year, but we're not told. Um, But certainly by the time that they are back, um, they are making that trip every year. Yeah, and they very well they very well may have. Um, Luke, something that is important for us to appreciate when um, when ancient historians are writing history, and we've talked about how Luke is writing history, um, they were more willing to make these kind of generic statements and understand that there may be exceptions without having to always clarify. Um, and that's not because they're trying to deceive. It's not because they don't care about being accurate. It's just 
their standards were sometimes different than us. And so if Luke is omitting that, that doesn't necessarily mean he's contradicting Matthew. But you're right, Barbara, it may well be that every year, even from Egypt, they're making that trip. All right, so um, <clears throat> Jesus here is now 12 years old. Uh, that sounds awfully young to us. 12-year-old is someone who is just a boy. Um, but for Jews in Jesus' time, uh, Jesus is actually on the cusp of what they would consider adulthood at age 12. Um, boys, Jewish boys entered manhood at age 13. So Jesus is on the cusp of manhood here um, in this account. And so what happens on their way back to Nazareth after the Passover? They lose him. Joseph and Mary lose him. Um, and remembering again that Jesus is on the cusp of manhood here, uh, that might better that might help us better appreciate how Jesus' parents um, could let this happen. He is almost an adult. And we already read before this that Jesus is very wise for his age. And so perhaps they're trusting him with a little extra responsibility, a little extra independence, and that's how they end up losing Jesus. Um, and also, as Luke tells us, they're in a caravan uh, with a lot of relatives and acquaintances. Um, and so it's likely that some among the caravan were watching all the children in the whole caravan. You know, there might be like a group in charge of overseeing all the children, and then the rest can, can continue on in the caravan. Um, and so perhaps G Joseph and Mary believe that Jesus is among all those other children, when, of course, in reality, um, he's not. But let's see what happens next. Um, Sue, I, I saw your hand go up a moment ago to read. If, if you wouldn't mind reading verses 46 through 52. So when Jesus' parents um, ask him uh, why he stayed back and why he worried his parents to death, um, Jesus gives an answer here that hints at his special relationship uh, with God. He asks, why were you looking for me? Uh, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Now, at some level, um, any Jew perhaps could say that God is uh, their father, and they are his children. They are God's chosen people. Um, but as Luke's gospel goes on, uh, it will become super clear that Jesus views himself as God's son in a special uh, sense. And so we get some hints of that here. Um, oh, I thought I had it on the screen. Also, earlier in Luke, as Jesus' birth was being announced by the angels, uh, they already announced to Mary that her son will be God's son in a special sense. And so um, Jesus' answer here shows uh, his favor with God. Um, and then something to note in this account of Jesus in the temple is the amazement, the astonishment of people uh, around Jesus. Uh, people in the temple who see him interacting with the Jewish teachers, uh, they are amazed. Jesus' parents are astonished at this. But also notice that even though they're amazed and astonished, they also don't fully understand what's going on. They don't fully understand Jesus either. And as we keep on going in Luke and as Jesus' adult public ministry gets underway, uh, we'll see this same kind of reaction uh, to Jesus at different moments. Uh, people are often amazed by Jesus, but that doesn't necessarily move them to faith. Uh, they may still be confused, they may lack understanding, uh, or they may... As Jesus grows up and begins his ministry, they may also feel threatened, uh, and they may feel scared and re resist Jesus instead, even though they're still amazed by him. Um, and, and Jesus, as his public ministry gets underway, he's hoping to not only create this kind of amazement here, 
but he's hoping to move people uh, to faith. He wants to move someone to faith. But again, not everyone is going to respond that way. Um, but notice here that while everyone is amazed, Mary is treasuring up all these things in her heart. This is something that we observed a couple of weeks ago and that we've been observing since Luke's gospel began. Um, Mary may not fully grasp everything that is happening, but she knows that God is at work and she is treasuring up these moments. Um, the angel that appeared to her in Luke chapter 1, uh, then her encounter with her cousin Elizabeth while Elizabeth was, was still pregnant carrying John the Baptist, um, her encounter with Simeon and Anna in the temple, and now this, all these things have clearly left uh, an impact on her and have made her more perceptive of how God is working uh, through Jesus. And so this brings the opening section of Luke uh, to a close, and in chapter 3, we'll fast forward to uh, when Jesus and John are both adults. Um, Kelsey. That's a great question. Um, there are Jewish writings that detail some of this stuff, and I, I can't remember how it all plays out exactly at what stage they begin, you know, learning in the synagogues about the law and how long that goes. But all those things would be happening around now. I mean, Jesus would, would either have already been trained in the law in that way, like going to school, or it's about to happen. Uh, and he would be entering in a time where he needs to think about all right, adopting his father's trade or doing whatever it is he's going to do as an adult and learning about those things. And so, yeah, he's on the cusp of all those things happening. And clearly Jesus um, is above and beyond the average child at his age in terms of his understanding of the law. That's why they're so amazed. He's, he's, um, he's asking the types of questions that are far more advanced than the average uh, Jewish boy at age 12 would be asking. That's a good question. Um, most Jews who wanted to be rabbis would first attach themselves to someone who already is a rabbi, uh, and, and they would seek out that rabbi and follow him around as a disciple, and then they would you know, be able eventually to present themselves as rabbis. Jesus apparently doesn't do this kind of thing, and he certainly doesn't, and, and the Gospels will make it clear, he doesn't teach the way other rabbis teach. He teaches with a sense of authority that they don't have. Um, and in terms of why would, why would his disciples follow him if they didn't already know some things about him? Again, we're, we are not told. We're often, we're, we're in the dark about these years. Um, but Jesus, he does work miracles as he gets older, and his teaching is quite impressive and amazing, um, especially for someone who doesn't teach like other rabbis teach. And so even if they don't know much about Jesus before they encounter him, I think those things may be enough for them to to be persuaded to, to follow him. Go ahead, Barbara. Chapter 4, that's at his hometown in Nazareth. As he teaches, they're like, 
Don't we know him? Isn't this the carpenter's son? So they're not expecting him to be who he is. They're astonished that he is teaching the way he is. They, they do not expect this. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. Well, and even when Jesus does begin his public ministry, um, when he heals someone, he often tells them to keep it quiet. You know, time hasn't come, and so maybe that is a little press. Maybe a, that's a little bit of an example of how he was even before he began his public ministry. Maybe he was keeping things, uh, you know holding the cards quite close to the chest so that people would not quite know the fullness of who he was. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps so. Well, um, before we move on into the next stage of Luke's gospel, uh, I want to make a couple of broad observations from the whole first two chapters of Luke. Um, <clears throat> one, a theme of this section for the past few weeks has been that the coming of Jesus is the coming of salvation. The angels um, announced uh, God's salvation as they announced the coming of Jesus uh, so have the prophet uh, Simeon, the prophetess Anna, Zacharias, he was talking about John the Baptist, talked about that. Um, so God bringing salvation through Christ is a major theme of Luke and Acts. And Luke introduces it right at the outset, right in these early chapters. And Luke has also made it clear in these early chapters that salvation is truly for everyone. Uh, those who are on the margins of Jesus' world and Luke's world, uh, they are at the center of God bringing salvation. Jesus into the world. The angels appear to shepherds. Um, a, a little village girl from Nazareth gives birth to the Messiah. Um, so Jesus will reverse the standards and the values of his culture and society. Uh, we'll see that as we keep going. Um, he will be a different, he will be a far better type of savior than earthly rulers like the Roman emperor and, and people like that. And we're, we're already seeing hints of these things early on. Um, <clears throat> Another theme is that salvation for Jews means that Jesus will fulfill their hopes. He will restore them. Uh, we've already read here about Jesus being someone who is descended from David, uh, who will sit on David's throne, who will restore the nation. And then salvation for Gentiles means that they will worship, they will serve the true God as well. Jesus will be a light for the Gentiles. Um, but again, we've already received some hints early on in Luke that not everyone will accept God's salvation. So Luke is giving us some foreshadowing of what will happen in Jesus' ministry and what will happen in uh, the book of Acts as his disciples go out into all the world uh, to spread the gospel. Um, <clears throat> Luke has also uh, made it clear that both of these figures who were miraculously born, and both of them are important in the first couple chapters of Luke, uh, Luke has made it clear that both John the Baptist and Jesus are important in fulfilling uh, God's plan for salvation. Um, their birth stories and their, their, their little brief summaries of their childhoods, they run parallel uh, to each other. Uh, both of them have miraculous births. Both of them have prophecies made about them when they're born, these kinds of things. But all through these opening chapters, even though their lives are running parallel, um, Luke has kept the focus primarily on Jesus. And so he's shown in different ways that Jesus is on a different level. He's on a higher level um, than John. And, and again, we've seen that in a few ways over the past couple weeks. But the last way we see it is how their childhood is talked about. Um, John the Baptist gets one summary statement of his childhood. Jesus gets two summary statements, and he gets two accounts of his childhood. So clearly there's a lot more focus going on um, towards Jesus. So this is another way that Luke is directing our attention primarily towards Jesus so that we don't let someone like John the Baptist, who is a very impressive individual, uh, but we don't let someone like that distract us from Jesus. 
And so there's a really good application here for us today in the way Luke presents Jesus and John the Baptist. It can be tempting to get so caught up in human leaders in the church that we can forget about the fact that they're just servants of the true leader. They are servants of Jesus. Uh, and Luke wants to make sure we don't forget that as we're beginning to read his gospel. <clears throat> All right, so now that we've wrapped up the first couple chapters of Luke and are ready to move into chapter 3, I know we've already had a, a few questions and comments, but any other reflections on Luke 1 and 2 uh, before we move into Luke chapter 3? All right, um, we probably won't get through everything I was hoping for us to get through um, because we had to make up some ground this morning, but that's okay. Um, Luke now fast forwards, at, now that he's told us about the birth of Jesus and the birth of the one who will prepare the way for Jesus, uh, he fast forwards to when both of these characters, the Messiah, Jesus, and John the Baptist, when they are adults. Um, <clears throat> and so the best way uh, to sum up this section is that it is a time of preparation, a time of getting ready. And this section moves from chapter, or from chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4 and verse 13. And so this kind of one and a half chapters or so is kind of like a deep breath um, before God's plan of bringing salvation really gets underway in Jesus. Um, the first couple of chapters in Luke were full of amazing things happening. Um, there's good news bursting into the world from heaven as angels appear to Elizabeth and Mary uh, and the shepherds. And Jesus is born from a, from a virgin. People are prophesying about him. So there's lots of exciting, spectacular things happening in the chapters that we've just covered for the past few weeks. And then the section after this preparations, preparation section, it's going to be full of activity too. Um, Jesus is going to be moving around. He's going to be teaching. He's going to be healing, he's going to be calling disciples, he's going to be engaging in controversial debates. Uh, so there's a lot of action on either side of this section, and right here in this section is like a deep breath um, between these two exciting sections, getting us ready for what's going to come as Jesus' ministry really uh, begins. And so this time of preparation is going to unfold in a couple of different ways. Um, one, again, John the Baptist, he will be um, he will begin his ministry of getting people ready for the Messiah. And then Jesus himself, while the people are getting ready for the Messiah, Jesus will undergo some things that prepare him to be uh, the Messiah, that prepare him for his ministry. So the people need to be prepared, and Jesus needs to be prepared. And both of those things happen uh, in this section. So a quick overview of the contents here. Um, verses 1 through 9, we get the coming and the teaching of John the Baptist. And then we also get the responses uh, to John the Baptist, uh, various responses from different groups of people. Uh, we even get Jesus' response to John the Baptist, which is his baptism uh, by John. Um, and then Luke separates John the, Baptist's, John the Baptist's ministry from Jesus' ministry by inserting Jesus' genealogy right between the two. So we read about that as well. Um, and then Jesus will endure a time of testing in the wilderness um, by Satan. So those are the things that, that happen in this time of getting ready uh, for the Messiah. Uh, we won't be able to look at every single part of this over the next couple of weeks in, in great detail, but there are a couple of things I'd like us to be on the lookout for as we move into this uh, section. First of all, I'd like us to notice how God is working through people to accomplish his will. Uh, when we read the Gospels, we uh, rightly notice that Jesus is the central character of the Gospels. Uh, but sometimes we can forget that God the Father and the Holy Spirit are also very active uh, in the Gospels. And we'll see how active they are uh, in some of this section. And then also, the second thing I'd really like us to notice as we look through this time of preparation, um, I'd like us to pay attention to um, the forces that are hostile to Jesus in this section. They'll be important as well as Jesus' ministry gets underway. So we'll just do what we can this morning until, until the bell rings. Um, but Luke begins this new section um, actually in the same way that he began his account of Jesus' birth. If you remember when Luke begins telling us about Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 1, he starts out by setting that within 
the, the setting of world history and also within the setting of local politics? Well, um, <clears throat> Luke does the same thing as he fast forwards to, to John the Baptist as an adult. He says that now a man named Tiberius is emperor, uh, Pontius Pilate is governor of Judea, Herod rules over uh, Galilee, that's where Jesus lives. Uh, we also read some other rulers, we read about the high priesthood. And it's during this time that the word of God comes to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he travels around the Jordan River, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Um, it's important for us to appreciate um, how John baptizing people is a fulfillment of his ministry. Uh, Luke mentions a forgiveness element to John's baptism. Um, and in addition to this forgiveness element, also those who were baptized by John, that asserts that they have responded positively to his message. And therefore, they have repented, right? It's a baptism of repentance. And so if they have repented and if they have responded positively to John's message, then they are ready to receive the Messiah, which is exactly what John the Baptist ministry is all about. He's getting people ready. And those who are baptized clearly are ready to receive the Messiah, or at least should be ready to receive uh, the Messiah. Um, <clears throat> so Luke is going, that's awfully small, I apologize for that. Um, but Luke presents what John is doing as the fulfillment of Scripture. Uh, he quotes from Isaiah, and because the font is small, I'll just read this. Uh, but he says, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So Luke presents John's ministry as the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, something big, something wonderful is happening uh, through John. And in addition to that scripture um, quotation, notice again the way Luke introduces John. He introduces John by saying, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. This is really important because this is the way that prophets are often introduced in the Old Testament. Um, I've got just a few examples on the screen, and these are the opening words of multiple books of the prophets. Um, but they often begin with, the words of so-and-so, or the word of the Lord came to so-and-so, um, and that's exactly the same way that um, John is introduced. And this is really fitting, because back in chapter 1, when, when John was born, his father, Zechariah, prophesied that John would be called the prophet of the Most High. So John is next in the, the long line of prophets of God's people. That is how John is being uh, presented. And notice also John's location. Um, he is in the wilderness. He's around the Jordan. The wilderness, the Jordan River, are those locations, are they important anywhere else in the Bible? Israel spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. They crossed into the promised land by crossing through the Jordan. Um, so John is being presented as a prophet, and his location recalls major moments from the Bible, major moments from the history of God's people, and he's preparing the way of the Lord. He's preparing for all flesh to see the salvation of God. Um, we'll move quickly to his message, and this is probably about where we will run out of time, but we see his message in verses 7 through 9, and it's not a very cheery message. Uh, John the Baptist's message, he, he is a preacher of coming judgment. Uh, we would probably call him like a fire and brimstone preacher uh, today. Uh, he says that there is coming wrath. Uh, people need to repent. They need to live as people who realize that judgment is coming. And um, John uses a, an agricultural metaphor to really get this across. He says the people are trees and they need to bear fruit. Uh, to show their repentance. And if they don't do that, they will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Um, and notice that the crowds are coming out 
into the wilderness to see John. It's not that John is coming from the wilderness into the cities and villages to preach. People are coming out from those places to uh, the wilderness. And this is important because the wilderness is wild precisely because people aren't there. It's a dangerous place because it's, it's largely uninhabited by people. It's inhabited by wild animals and things. Um, it's a place that is isolated from society. It's isolated from cultural pressures and mindsets. And so John, by being in the wilderness and having people come out to him, he is literally calling them out from society. He is calling them out from the pressures of the world. And then as, as they get out from that stuff, he then tells them to repent, to not let the world corrupt them. Uh, so that when the world is judged, and he's saying it's coming, when the world is judged, they will not be condemned with the rest of the world. Um, I want us to keep John's style of ministry. In the wilderness, calling for judgment, people are coming out to see him. I want us to keep John's style of ministry in mind for when we get to Jesus' style of ministry. Uh, this will become really important to, to line the two up. Um, but keep John's style of, of ministry in mind. And the crowds, they seem to be, uh, as Luke records it, a lot of them are responding quite positively uh, to John. They're asking, what, does, what do we need to do? Um, what, what does it look like to bear fruit in keeping with repentance? That is what John is calling them to do. And their response is, all right, well, what do we need to do? And John gets really practical in his response. Uh, he says, in verse 11, he says, share what you have with those who have nothing. Um, to the tax collectors who come to him, he says, be honest in your transactions. Uh, be honest as you do your job. To the soldiers, he tells them, don't use your power. Don't use your authority to threaten others. Don't use that stuff to enrich yourselves. Uh, they should be content with the money that they honestly earn and not seek to, to gain more through dishonest means. Um, and so, And we don't really have to be Today, we don't have to be soldiers or tax collectors to appreciate um, how to apply these types of teachings in our own lives. Uh, John is basically saying that we should resist whatever temptations um, naturally come along with our life situation, with our circumstances. We should resist those, and we should do what's right instead. Um, <clears throat> second bell is rung, so that's where, we'll, where we will leave off. We'll continue with John the Baptist's ministry next week, and we'll also look at how Jesus is prepared during this time for when his ministry begins. So we'll stop here, but thank you all, and we'll have worship in a few minutes.